What's good YouTube? This is Precog from Headphones.com and today we're going to be talking all about my trip to Singapore. So yes, I took a week long trip to Singapore and this was for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted it to be a graduation present of sorts to myself as I just got my degree. Two, it was happening at the same time as CanJam Singapore. And three, if you're not aware already, Singapore is basically the land of IMs. Of course, I want to give a big shout out to Headphones.com for sponsoring the majority of this trip. As you guys might know, and as I just alluded to, I don't exactly have the money to be spending on a whim on a trip like this. And yeah, with that being said, let's dive right into the trip. Okay, here's a quick tour of my hotel room and a general peek into just how much of a slob I am when traveling. Um, and I say hotel room, but realistically, I think this is more of a prison cell given that there's not even a window. Okay, so this is the end of day one in Singapore. It was a pretty insane day. I basically got off the flight, totally jet lagged, and met up with the boys, and then. Um, we went out to eat. Well, first the car broke down, so we went out to eat first while that got fixed. After that, we went to Zeppinco for about an hour, I want to say, and then we went to eat again. So yes, we ate a lot of food. Very good food, I might add, given what I am used to eating at my uh, university dining commons. Um, and then after that, we went to Zeppinco again for another three hours where I basically listened to a bunch of Subtonics prototypes. And if you're unaware of what Subtonic is, they are an upcoming Singaporean brand that is made up of a few uh, enthusiasts like myself that I talk with often. So yeah, that was very interesting. I've got to hear possibly one of the best items on the planet. Um, it's still in the prototype phase, so we'll see how that turns out eventually. After that, again, we ate. I think you're seeing a pattern here. I ate a lot of food today and I think I'm about to go into a food coma right after this. But yeah, definitely a very eventful day, pretty much nonstop, and I will see you guys tomorrow for day one of Kanji. Okay, so I've just wrapped up day one of Kanjium, and just like the first day I got here, it has been pretty much non-stop. Um, I think I've listened to roughly two or three dozen IMs today, and I got down impressions for pretty much most of them. Um, I'm still working on a few of them there. Uh, that said, I think the one that stood out the most to me today was this one here from uh, Elysian Acoustic Labs. This is the Diva. and. Um, I won't spoil it too much, but I'll say that I think that this is probably one of the most solid IMs that I've heard for, uh, what is it, roughly $1,500, that's what this is being released for, and it's really going to give an opportunity for listeners to sort of, uh, not, I don't want to say this is like an entry-level IM or anything of the sort, but it's going to give more people an opportunity to hear what this brand is all about. I won't go too in-depth with like the sound details, but it is very close to sort of emulating the house sound of the Annihilator, but with some added colorations that I think are very much appropriate. I heard a bunch of other items too. I'll list off some of the more maybe notable ones. The Dita Perpetua, that was pretty decent. Um, I was kind of surprised I haven't heard a Dita ion before. It had a nice base shelf. Uh, interesting sort of approach from like one to five K Hertz. I think it had like a level rise upwards. Um, I think what stood out to me most about the, the Dita uh, Perpetua though was the imaging performance. Um, it sounded more expansive, it sounded grander than most single dynamic drivers that I've heard. Let's see here, what else did I like? As you can tell, I don't like a lot of things, so it's a bit difficult for me to find stuff on this list that I that has stood out to me. Oh, the Vision Ears items are actually pretty solid. I heard the EXT and the... I'm gonna botch the name, the, the Phoenix, something like that. The EXT has a very interesting sort of like warm signature, but with very good extension up top. Um, almost a little bit too much presence in the treble, I want to say, at around like 7 to 9k hertz or so. It's a little bit splashy in the mid treble. 
On the other hand, the Phoenix is basically a refinement of the Orconic, the, uh, the flagship IM from Visioneers that was a limited run. Um, it basically sounds like the uh, setting two of the Orconic with more treble extension um, and a little bit less uh, sort of grittiness to decay as a result. In terms of what I didn't like, um, I think some of the, the low moments of the show, for me at least, were the, let's see here, some of the craftier ones, the Argentium and the Coupon, they're kind of wonky. The, the fur audio items, the Neon 4 and the, uh, what's it called, the Krypton 5, they were kind of wonky. The Krypton 5 in particular, it sounded very like recessed and just sort of muffled in the mid-range in general. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what was going on with that, it just sounded very dampened. Um, the XC6 I think was better, it just, it, had, it definitely had good technicalities, it had good detail, I'll say that, but the, I think the overall tonal balance of it was not as desirable, at least, at least for my subjective preferences. Most of the Jomo, the new Jomo items, I wasn't a big fan of. I think the, the one that stood out the most was the, let's see here, the, the Spider. Um, I think that was like an 8 balance temperature setup. It sort of reminded me of the Fearless Audio S8 items, in fact. Um, imagine that, but yeah. Noble Audio DX12 was pretty mediocre, if I'm being honest. It sounded like an average dynamic driver I am. And yeah, that's pretty much the gist of the day one impressions. Um, what was pretty cool, though, was getting to meet Critical, actually. I ended up meeting up with Critical. We went out for lunch. We went out for dinner uh, with some of the rest of the guys and got to eat a bunch of very good food. Singapore, in general, has been a very interesting experience. Um, I, I think I love most things about it. The one thing that gets to me every time, though, is definitely the heat. Um, combined with like the, the humidity, it just feels very damp and very like, very hard to move around. I thought it would be very easy to get to like the conventions and stuff to like Kanjam because it's only like half a mile away. Then I went outside and it immediately started pouring and um, it's just so clammy, so difficult to get around, um, especially if you're on foot. And I, I, I don't know, um, maybe that's just me um, coming from the, the Bay Area where the average temperature is essentially the uh, record lowest temperature it's ever been in Singapore. The malls here are also insane. Um, <laughs> the size of the malls, the sheer size is absolutely incredible. I think like <laughs> just one mall I went into was like at least multiple times the size of the mall that I have back home. <laughs> um, and the crazy thing too is that they're all sort of like interconnected in between. So like it's a complete maze and it just goes on and on. Um, so I was basically just like walking behind uh, Corinne and the other guys the whole time, like oh, looking around like totally dazed because I had no idea where we were going. Um, it's a very densely populated sort of country where like everybody's just squished together. There's so many people all at once and it just, I don't know, it's just very different from being in the US, I'll say that. <laughs> oh yeah, I also had boba from, what's it called, Noksha? Sha Milk? Something, Milk Sha I think is the name. And the boba here is way, way better than in California. Um, if you've ever been to California, the boba is just not that good. Um, you gotta go to the places that like come from sort of like Taiwan. The, the, they bring in, they import the stuff from Taiwan. And just in general, I think in Singapore, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more motivation to create low cost, high quality food. Um, simply because of the, the sheer amount of competition. Um, like every few blocks you go, there's another boba shop set up. And if you're not good, if the boba there is not good, people are going to go to the other one. Uh, I think that about sums up day one of Kanjam or my day in general. Uh, again, pretty eventful, and I suspect that tomorrow will be <laughs> equally eventful. Okay, so it is currently day four in Singapore. I didn't get around to filming a sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing yesterday, so I'll give a brief uh, summary of what happened on day two of CanJam, which is where I was basically assessing the headphones, as I mostly got through almost all of the IMs on day one, or the IMs that I was interested in hearing at least. I don't think there was a particular headphone that really stood above the rest for me at the show, but I can go over some of the ones that I thought were pretty decent at least. Um, starting with, of course, the ZMF Atrium. I think that's the one, the headphone, that a lot of people are going to be interested in my thoughts on. Um, I will say that overall, it is pretty decent. It was definitely better than the Verite Closed I heard, which I didn't really like. Um, the Verite Closed had a very strong 5K Hertz peak that just sort of, sort of marred the performance of the headphone for me. I just found it to be a little bit too colored in general. 
Uh, by contrast, the Verite Closed had a more appropriate peanut compensation, so the mid-range, the upper mid-range in particular, was more forward and more along the lines of neutral. At the same time, it generally maintained a slightly warmer balance in the lower mid-range in the base. Um, come the treble, I did think it had a small peak, maybe around like 5k hertz, but nowhere near to the extent of the Verite Closed. Um, the treble extension, I would say, was decent. I could tell it rolled off after around maybe like 15k hertz or so, but I do think that's mostly in line with these more type of colored presentations. For technical performance, the Atrium obviously wasn't the best performer for clarity, and that's just sort of what happens when you have this sort of tuning. That said, I did find it to have a good sense of internal detail, and the mid-range in particular was very, very nice to listen to. Uh, just very pleasant on the ears, and I just found myself glued to it for like, I think I listened for almost half an hour to the Atrium. The other thing that stood out about the Atrium, I think, was its sort of just presentation in general. Um, it felt very sort of like diffuse and a little bit like holographic, which I think lent to the sort of uh, musical sound that ZMF was trying to capture. But yeah, overall, really nice headphone. I don't know if it's going to be worth the price, but obviously that's not exactly what um, you're entirely paying for when you're buying a ZMF headphone. Um, a, lot of that, a lot of the cost is predicated on the build quality, getting to choose the wood and all that good stuff. Another headphone that stood out to me was the Stax X9000. Um, this is their latest flagship. Apparently they're not even selling it though because they don't have the, the parts to make it or something. They're having supply chain issues, I think is what the, the gist of it was. I will say, however, that if you are a fan of the traditional Stax sound, then I don't think that the uh, X9000 is going to do it for you. Um, it was a very mid bassy headphone. That was what surprised me the most. It had quite a lot of mid bass and then had a droop off of the sub bass at around 40 hertz or so. Um, from there, in the mid range, the upper mid range in particular, it had an aggressive rise. And then in the treble, of course, it had the characteristic um, crazy extension that the Stax headphones are known for delivering. Um, it was definitely a very technical headphone. However, I don't know if the unique, the unique tonality is really worth the aggressive upcharge over something like the uh, Stax L700 Mark II, for example. And speaking of which, I got to hear the original Stax L700, and it is fantastic. It was probably one of the most resolving headphones that I heard at the show, and it was really just a treat listening to the uh, Stax L700. Um, I don't know if the tonality is like quite on point, but like at, at, at some point it just really doesn't matter. Like the technicalities on it are just so fantastic that um, I just stopped looking or listening for the frequency response. Um, but yeah. Another headphone that stood out to me was the D8000 Pro from Final Audio. The build on that thing is fantastic. Just very, very um, structurally sound and it feels very complete in the hand. Um, outside of that, the sound, of course, is also very good. And it has the sort of, what is it, the sort of neutral analytical presentation that uh, Final Audio's headphones are known for. And I think this is probably the best interpretation of it. I've heard the ADX 5K and I think that was just a little bit too strident, a little bit too thin for my taste and the D8000 Pro struck a, a little bit of a better balance while maintaining um, a better sort of sense of technicalities. Um, so yeah, the technicalities on the D8000 Pro are just very solid across the board. Great imaging, great clarity, um, and it's mostly thanks to that sort of like plateau from 3 to 10k hertz onwards without any peaks. I think that the... Uh, I don't know if the ADX 5K had peaks, but it had at least a little bit too much 3 to 5k hertz, which could make it sibilant in my opinion. Another headphone that stood out to me, maybe not for the best reasons though, was the AB1266 from Abyss. Uh, the build on that thing is... It is something else, I'll say that. <laughs> um, the chassis is just ridiculous, it is very uncomfortable, and um, it just makes you look like something out of a Franken horror film. I really don't know what else to say about that. Um, the sound though is more commendable in my opinion. Um, I was actually impressed with the bass response on the AB1266. Um, I think it's a planar, I think it's a planar headphone, but yeah, really, really good bass response. Very tight, very like, very slammy. I don't know if it was just the source I was listening to it off of, the, the very expensive source that they they like mandate you use, but yeah, it was a very, very slammy headphone. Um, the mid-range was a little bit odd, but I didn't really care about the upper mid-range recession. I think the bigger issue was the, the sort of peak at around five to six K hertz contrasted to that, which could make it a hair, um, make it a hair like hot at times. But yeah, very technical, um, very dynamic, and um, I can sort of see why those headphones have a cult following despite the uh, less than stellar ergonomics of the headphone. I think that's pretty much a brief recap of the headphones that stood out to me at CanJam. I heard a lot of other ones, but you can go read the full um, write-up if you want to check out my thoughts on those. As for today, on day four, I am just about to head out and go check out Critical's place. I'm gonna go check out all of his IMs. I hear he has over, I think he told me to stop counting at 200 at this point, so that is going to be fun. And I will see you then.
Okay, so I didn't really get to doing a sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation on days four and five. Um, so I'll just give a play-by-play -play of basically what happened. I basically spent the next five hours with Crin, just camped out listening to his IMs and measuring them from my own database, which you can find um, probably linked below somewhere if I get around to doing that. I also got to check out Crin's speaker system, which was absolutely amazing. Um, probably one of the most like mind-blowing, well, I had a lot of mind-blowing experiences in Singapore, but the speaker system that Crin was using was definitely quite up there. Um, basically consisted of Newman monitors and a subwoofer. But as you guys might know, there is sort of an unspoken hierarchy in the audio world where it goes IMs, headphones, and then speakers. Speakers are at the top of the food chain. There is really no other transducer type that compares when it comes to that sense of dynamics, that sense of air being pushed. And um, the, 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 the really surprising thing about speakers is that because they're dead flat, you can actually listen very, very loudly, which I'm, I'm not endorsing this at all, but you can listen very, very loudly without like really noticing it for quite a while. Um, so it's very easy to get carried away, and that is exactly the case of what happened when I was listening to Crin's setup. Speaker demo After this, we grabbed dinner at a local fried chicken place, which was really good as well. They were mostly famous for their fried chicken, but I also thought that their other food was really good too. They had like, I think coconut infused rice, and then they had also like salt, the little tiny salted fish that are really crunchy, and I really like those. Um, I haven't had those in a long time though, so that was nice to eat again. Okay, and I guess I should talk about day five now, which was actually probably even more eventful than any of the other days. Um, on this day, I woke up at around, I think, 7.30 to go with Torque on a treetop walk. I think one of the most surprising things I saw was not necessarily the, the trail itself. I don't think the views were like spectacular or anything compared to stuff in the US. We did see a monkey on the trail, which is pretty funny. I don't think I've ever seen that in the US. Really, really exhausting too. I think we only walked around four miles or so, but I was feeling the heat, man. After this, we grabbed some lunch at a cafe. I don't remember the name. I really wish I could because they had so much variety on the menu. But I had, I think, Korean fried chicken, and then Torque had a uh, salmon and toast plate. After this, I went to create my COVID test. There's another little story with that. They basically messed up my date of birth and put down 2022. Um, I certainly hope I am not, I think, what is it? No, I, actually, I wouldn't have even been born, I think, given that it's not even November yet, which is my date of, my date of birth uh, month. But basically I didn't figure this out until around like 11 p.m. And then I was basically just freaking out until maybe like 1 a.m. Trying to get this sorted, sending out email after email, sending them texts. But of course they're, they're shut down at that point for the day. The clinic that is, is shut down. And then of course I had to get up at 5.30 in the morning to go to the airport and take the flight back to the U.S. But uh, yeah, definitely a little bit stressful to say the least. Okay, but dang, I have definitely gone off on a tangent. To sort of sum up the rest of the day, I spent most of it at Zepp Co. The Zepp Co. is a fantastic audio shop, probably one of the most popular audio shops in Singapore. They are doing something different that I've not seen at a lot of other audio retailers. And I'll sort of let the footage speak for itself. I have an interview. I don't know if it's going to make it into this video just because the content, the length of it is so long. But it was great chatting with Christy and Fung, basically the, the brother and sister owners of Zepp Co. And they explained a lot to me about the sort of mission behind the store and what they are trying to do in the future with it. Like I've always, I, I went before, so before I knew about sound, mm -hmm. I, I've always enjoyed like hanging in cafes. Yeah. Because it's just so nice, it's so mm -hmm. relaxing. You can do your, you can do your things, but then, um, but I, I, I cannot cook. I, I'm just not good at that. <laughs> like, you know, if you're not a chef, you shouldn't run a cafe because yeah. if your chef runs, then, you're kind you're of fine. stranded. Right. You don't know any recipes, you, you don't yeah. know how to recreate the recipes. It's just not my talent really, but I have mm. a super picky ear. So oh, okay. I've always yeah. um yeah, I, I know I, I when I realized that I could tell the difference between sound and I was like, mm -hmm. nobody mm. said a cafe has to be food, you know. Right. Correct. So why not let my cafe be audio instead? And then oh, okay, very cool. Like, it's a very music, cool way of music, thinking of it. Yeah, mm. music and coffee. I think the best way of summing it up though is that they're sort of trying to break down the traditional barriers to entry when it comes to um, audio retail. If you've gone to other audio stores in the past, then you know that there's usually just sort of an aura of like, you can't buy this, it's very exclusive, and you sort of just 
I, at least I know I've gotten the feeling that I don't want to enter these stores just because it feels very prestigious. And to this end, they've created a very unique environment by meshing an audio store with a cafe and sort of creating this place where audiophiles can hang out, chat with one another, and in addition to this, avoid all the salesman talk and get their ears on a lot of different things at the same time, which is invaluable, especially in a hobby this subjective. Outside of this, Zepp & Co also does in-ear impressions in-house. So I had those done again for the Elysian Diva this time. And as in addition to this, they also scan them digitally. So you don't necessarily even need to send the physical mold to the retailer or the, the manufacturer, excuse me, uh, that you're planning to get his CIM from. But yeah, I had an awesome time at Zepp. I basically spent from, I think, maybe one, two o'clock, I think, two o'clock to eight o'clock, which is closing. And then I went out again with some of my friends for dinner and um, we just chatted about audio and some other plans in the future. I definitely think that this is an experience that is going to stick with me for a long time, just because I personally have never traveled out of the country alone before. Um, it's always been with my parents, my relatives, something like that. And getting to do all these things on my own was definitely a sort of a, sort of a turning point for me. It also opened my eyes to the idea that there's a lot more to audio than what public perception normally sees it as being. Um, for a lot of people outside of the hobby, it's a rich man's hobby, it's a snobby thing. Um, for very introverted people, but I don't really think that's the case. I met a lot of awesome people that just wanted to hang out, chat, eat good food, and um, just enjoy each other's company, really. At the end of the day, it wasn't even necessarily about the gear. It was more about the people that sort of enhanced the hobby and the experience behind it. Okay, but I'm rambling at this point. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in my next video.